Hello friends. Welcome to the Eastern Front channel. Today we will talk with you about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant, Arno von Lenski, who fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. Everything was ready for the handover, the messages from the Army High Command had been clamped together in a folder. These interested me most of all, that is why I had asked the lieutenant colonel to tell me about them. I would go over them in detail in the next few days. My deputy took the folder, let us begin with the curious ones, several weeks ago Führer headquarters sent us a well-known battlefield painter from Leipzig. He was to record the Battle of Stalingrad in sketchbooks and on canvas. We sent him to General von Seidlitz, as he could best place him at focal points. The painter is to do preparatory work for a vast picture that he will paint in his Leipzig studio for Hitler. Can we be responsible for the risks he will encounter at the front? The painter, an old man, is wearing field gray uniform, he should already be busy at work. Perhaps you will have the opportunity to discover for yourself on a trip to the List Corps, replied the lieutenant colonel. Right, carry on, I urged him. When you gave me your impressions of the homeland on your return from the airfield, I was reminded of a recent decree from Führer headquarters, by which we must constantly nominate soldiers, non-commissioned officer and young officers, who display bravery in the battle for Stalingrad for the Knight's Cross, or the German Cross in gold and send their names to Hitler for confirmation. The first of these, a second lieutenant, returned four days ago, he told me that Hitler had received him very jovially. Finally he had given an account on the radio about his experiences at the front, which was extraordinarily highly honored. The daily newspaper brought out his report with his picture, the propaganda at the front was not far behind. In the key of soldiers newspaper appeared running descriptions of the battle from the pen of specialist Fritsch. In any case there is some method in this. As long as we don't have Stalingrad, something has to replace it even if it is only refined propaganda. My impression is that many people at the front and back home are no longer attracted to it. The number of people tired of the war is immense and grows daily, certainly the final taking of the city will bring about a change of heart. There is also a letter from the Army High Command along the same lines. On Hitler's suggestion, a Stalingrad shield is to be made, like the Crimean shield and the Narvik shield. The army has been tasked with producing the design for a memorial plaque by the November 25th. At this point the door opened and Paulus came in, we stood up. Sit down, gentlemen, I won't disturb you. As I was going past outside along the road, I heard from Senior Sergeant Major Cupper that you were still working, what is that letter you have in your hand? I passed him the letter about the Stalingrad shield. A sad chapter, we have hardly taken half the city and batter through the rest with our heads. With the present fighting state of the troops, it is hard to see us ever attaining the set goal. But they give hardly any thought to that at the high command. Instead, they bring up such trivial matters as a Stalingrad shield. After a short pause, the general went on, it will interest you, Adam, that an artist from the propaganda company has already made a draft. You will have to work on the award proposals later. I already have a horror of it, General, however, I am more impressed by how little progress we have made. When I flew off to my cure five weeks ago, I was hoping to see upon my return that the headquarters would no longer be here. On the contrary, everything remains as it was, I have not experienced anything like it in the three years of this war. You know yourself that in most of our divisions, the fighting strength of the regiments has sunk. But that is not the only reason, the ability of the Red Army soldiers to hold on has reached an extent in the last weeks that we had never expected. No soldier or officer speaks today of Ivan in disparaging terms, which used to be quite normal. The Red Army soldier is proving himself more from day to day as the master of close quarter fighting, in house fighting and in camouflage. Our artillery and air force virtually plow the enemy out of occupied ground before every attack, but as soon as our infantry leave cover they are hit by destructive defensive fire. Should we be successful in taking a place, the Russians immediately counterattack, throwing us back to the starting point? Reflectively Paulus looked up and then continued, moreover, the enemy leadership has become more single-minded. 
We have the impression that he will hold on to his positions on the west bank of the Volga at all costs. In some places the strips occupied by him are only 100 to 200 meters wide. If prisoner of war reports can be believed, the 62nd Army's headquarters are in the steep slopes of the West Bank. Since the middle of September General Chukov has been commander-in-chief of this army, again and again he was able to bring new divisions forward over the Volga, his fighting strength grows, ours fades away. The five engineer battalions flown in by air suffered such severe losses in the northern part of the city that we had to withdraw them from battle. Certainly the enemy has enormous difficulties, prisoners tell us that the 62nd Army is supplied at night over the Volga. As the army has hardly any vehicles or horses available on the West Bank, weapons, ammunition and food have to be carried from the landing places to the positions. The troops have no rest day and night, the wounded and sick are taken across to the East Bank in the unloaded boats. Until now it has not been possible for us to take the landing places or disrupt the water passage. But these are the same people, General, that we were driving before us for months. How can one explain this bitter resistance? I have already said that their command is assured of victory, General Chukov seems to be a very energetic troop commander. The time had passed quickly, we escorted the commander-in-chief to the village street, which was already completely dark. With an orderly officer who was waiting for him, Paulus went to the little house that he occupied. We, however, went back to work. The lieutenant colonel picked up the file that he had prepared for the handover. I would like to mention another of the Army High Command's measures. You too described how in Berlin, similarly to Veniza, wishful dreams have replaced reality. In the first days of October an engineer general reported to 6th Army headquarters with a fortress senior construction staff, two engineer regimental staffs, six engineer battalion staffs and a construction company. The Army High Command had instructed them to construct fortifications in Stalingrad. Our chief engineer, Colonel Stell, blew his top when he heard. To build bunkers one needs cement, gravel and wood, it could be that one could get gravel out of the Volga or Don. Cement and wood must be transported for hundreds of kilometers, even if that worked, we lack the necessary construction workforce. The close fighting in the city has also strongly involved the engineer battalions, finally the Russians would not sit and do nothing while we built concrete fortifications. My deputy recounted further that Sell had proposed to the 6th Army's chief of staff that the engineers should be set to constructing rear positions. The Army High Command abruptly turned down these proposals. Naturally no building material for bunkers appeared. Now a new Führer order demanded that these engineers should build heated bunkers for the tanks, which was equally unrealistic. I can vividly imagine how Sell reacted to such fantasy, I said. All that you have just reported is, in view of our complicated situation, plainly depressing. The lieutenant colonel looked at me quizzically for a second, you know, colonel, that I came from the Army High Command's personnel office. There I was several times astonished at the criticisms of the high command uttered by the older commanders. During the five weeks that I have been standing in for you I have realized what damage nonsensical measures and orders from the army high command have done to the troops. So it is, I replied, in this way that trust in the high command has been put to a severe test. It would be good if the officers of the general staff responsible for such orders had worked for some months in an army headquarters. Perhaps they would then at last realize how dangerous it is if one starts off with false calculations in commanding troops. The gentlemen in Führer headquarters have studied military history, operations results, strategy and tactics. Theoretically they are fully aware that a battle has never been won by underestimating the enemy and overestimating one's own forces, and that the troops have to pay with blood for the command's mistakes. I must openly state that as a result of my experiences in the Eastern Campaign, a considerable part of my once high regard for the general staff has vanished. It would be good if after your return to the personnel office you could pass on your observations to a competent office. Or do you intend to take over one of our regiments? This prospect remains as before, my role on the general staff has reinforced my decision. There is a regiment free in the 76th Infantry Division, Colonel Abraham is ill. 
General Rodenberg has asked for a replacement for him, here is the letter. I read the piece of paper, the illness does not appear to be too serious, General Rodenberg has suggested he be given a command in the rear area for a few weeks. We will discuss that shortly, but before that, another question. How are things with our potential officer school in Suvorovsky? Unfortunately we were unable to start the course on the prescribed date, the fighting within the city forced us to delay its assembly. Captain Goebel was only able to start the instruction in the middle of this month. That did not please me at all, for we urgently needed young infantry officers, I could not reprimand my deputy, for he was not responsible for the delayed start. I decided to do everything I could to speed up the instruction. Then I had a thought, how would it be if Colonel Abraham was ordered to Suvorovsky? He could recover there while at the same time advising Captain Goebel in the educating and training of the officer cadets. You yourself could take over Abraham's regiment. I am agreeable to that, Colonel, would Generals Paulus and Schmidt agree? We will go to the conference together tomorrow morning and take the written application to the Army High Command for your transfer to the 76th Infantry Division with us. If all goes well, you could take over your duty in two days' time. Then I had to tell him another secret, in my last visit to the personnel office I had brought up the subject of my relief as adjutant. Should General Paulus be agreeable, Colonel Sommerfeld, in peacetime the adjutant of the 4th Corps in Dresden, would be my successor. I will speak to the commander-in-chief about it in the next few days, but now it is time we packed up for the day. At the beginning of November, the commander of 11th Corps on the left wing of the army, General of Infantry Strecker, came to speak to Paulus personally. All the divisions on the northern front reported movements and concentrations of enemy troops in front of our left flank and the Romanian 3rd Army, which had been inserted between the 6th Army and the Italian 8th Army on the October 10th. Strecker demanded urgent countermeasures as the 4th Panzer Army operating in the south had identified attack preparations by the enemy. At Army headquarters and among the commanding generals there was no doubt about the enemy's intention to surround the 6th Army and the 4th Panzer Army. The Commander-in-Chief of Army Group B, Field Marshal von Wakes, and his Chief of Staff, General of Infantry von Sodenstein, shared the fears of 6th Army headquarters. But the Army High Command and Hitler could not accept this. The High Command simply did not take the 6th Army's report seriously, doubting that the Red Army could even think of another counteroffensive. To counter the threatening encirclement, Paulus had proposed retaking an observation post behind the Don. Lacking any conscience or sense of responsibility for the lives of the hundreds of thousands of soldiers involved, the Army High Command rejected the request. I was present when the telephone call came. The Chief of the Army General Staff, General of Infantry Zeitzler, was on the telephone in person and gave as an order Hitler's following remarks, the Red Army is defeated, it has no more worthwhile reserves, so is in no condition to engage in large attacks. Any assessment of the enemy must be taken from this basic point of view. Paulus was shattered by so false an appraisal, the crude reprimand injured him. The general staff must know what is about to happen, he said strongly. Are there then only yes-men in Hitler's entourage approving every nonsense, but then he fell quiet. The commander-in-chief of the 6th Army did not want to confine himself to an independent decision. Military obedience won over reason, an army reserve would be formed and placed ready behind the 11th Corps west of the Don southeast of Klatskaya. It was to consist of a mixed band of regimental strength, at whose core would be a tank hunting unit of the 14th Panzer Division, divisional headquarters, a Panzer Regiment, a tank hunting unit, an artillery regiment and part of the signals unit. Next day I was at a conference with General Paulus, almost without looking at it, the commander-in-chief thanked me for my report. His eyes were fixed on the situation map lying before him on the table. May I ask, General, how the situation on our left flank has changed since yesterday, I asked him. Much worse, the attitude of the Army High Command is simply incomprehensible to me. They imagine at headquarters, at a distance of more than 2,000 kilometers, that they can better assess the situation at the front than we can. That is absurd, such a disregard of the enemy is unique. If the Army High Command does not take measures to protect our flank soon, 
it could cost the whole of the Sixth Army. It is not just us signaling ever more clear indications of a counterattack, the 4th Panzer Army is seeing the same things on its front. That should alarm the people at Fuhrer headquarters, why doesn't the army chief of the general staff come and see us himself? Here the threatening danger cannot be turned away with speeches. I think so too, Adam, but this journey seems to put everyone off, Zeitzler would hardly dare to contradict Hitler. He delivered the proof of this yesterday, how can a chief of the general staff pass on such orders? And that was personal, too, Hitler booted Halder out of his company, the last general who at least had his own opinions on military matters. In relation to the political aim setting, there are no differences between Hitler and his generals. Apparently Hitler only wants collaborators like Keitel, who says yes to everything. The future will show whether Zeitzler went along with this illusionary strategy or whether he correctly assessed the strength and possibilities of the Red Army. After a few seconds he turned pensively, let us hope that everything will go well for once. By the beginning of October it was obvious to us at army headquarters that we would not be able to take Stalingrad with our badly hit divisions before winter set in. This brought some consequences, one of these was the redeployment of the army headquarters. Dolyabinskia, on the west bank of the Don between the bridges at Kalich and Peskavatka, had an unsuitable traffic situation. It also lacked a connection to the railway, and one could hardly speak of any sort of traffic system. After a reconnaissance sortie for a suitable headquarters, the choice fell on Nishicherskaya. The railway from the west ended not far away, and direct roads led from here to the subordinate corps. All this spoke for Nishicherskaya becoming the army's winter headquarters. In the first days of November the Army's Chief of Signals reported that communications to the Corps and Army Group had been established. The officers' mess and accommodation had been secured under the direction of the Headquarters Commandant, and I had checked out the prepared complex on the orders of the Commander-in-Chief. It was actually far better and more suitable than Dolyabinskia, the little town at the mouth of the Chur on the Don gave a clean, cared-for impression. Whitewashed single or two-story houses stood on the edge of white streets, gardens and yards completed the picture of the town. Almost all the houses were empty, as most of the inhabitants had left the place. Although all preparations for the move had been made, the chief of staff hesitated to set a date. Schmidt feared that moving back the army headquarters from Golyabinskia to Nishnichurskaya would have an adverse effect on the morale of the hard-fighting troops in the front line. Therefore, it was planned that the move would take place at short notice, the first to go to the winter headquarters, being part of the command section and the Army Signals Regiment. The senior quartermaster's department would remain as before near Kalich on the railway line to Stalingrad. After crossing the Don, the supply situation for the 6th Army tapered off considerably. Only one railway line was available for bringing forward fuel, ammunition and supplies. This came from the west the Amorozovsk and the Don Bridge near Richkov to Stalingrad. However, the railway bridge had been blown so that all the supplies had to be unloaded onto trucks at Cher Station and driven just over the bridge near Verchenchurskaya, before being reloaded onto the railway wagons, already waiting there. One can easily understand how complicated and time-consuming this was, often the railway track was blocked by either empty wagons or hospital trains creating blockages, tearing the stream of vital supplies apart. How would it be when winter came if additional warm clothing, heating material and fodder for horses had to be delivered, if there were also deep snowdrifts and black ice? These questions brought up other anxious concerns. In the middle of October, the Quartermaster General of the Army, Lt. Gen. Wagner, visited 6th Army Headquarters. He wanted to see for himself how the supplies were organized and how the whole supply system could be improved. But he too could not help, our new 1st General Staff Officer, Colonel Elslep, told me afterwards that Wagner had talked about the conditions at Fuhrer Headquarters. All the generals avoided contradicting Hitler all feared the hysterical outbursts of this lofty dictator. Wagner himself had informed the Supreme Commander in the summer of 1942 about the lack of sources of fuel and requested the supply situation be brought into consideration in the planning of operations. Afterwards Hitler had let him go with the words, I had not expected another answer from my generals, thank you. 
We had already often heard such accounts, how did that help us, not at all. The generals complained about Hitler, but they went on playing the game with him. With their tactical assistance, that hysterical man could continue pursuing the war. The generals might be contemptuous of the bohemian corporal, but the fact was that they had worked on his war plans, that with them he had gone from one adventure to another, driving millions of people senselessly to their deaths. In that lay the historical and human blame of the generals in the Second World War. I have been rushing ahead with this recognition of my own development. In those days of October 1942, I was still a long way from such a recognition. I had a feeling that something was not quite right about the whole mechanism of the Wehrmacht command. Sometimes I became angry about so much amateurism, sometimes quite depressed by it. But I did what I took to be my duty. Having myself started off with a military tradition and education, the thought that Paulus as commander-in-chief of the 6th Army had initiated disaster through his own independent decisions was then far from me. One of the explanations for this was that in October 1942, I had hardly yet reached Hell's front door. I had to go right through the inferno of Stalingrad to obtain a deeper understanding. But I will discuss this later. Among the supply problems that the 6th Army had to concern itself with as the 1942-43 winter approached was the securing of fodder for the thousands of horses. General Paulus decided therefore that all dispensable horses should be moved to the rear army area west of the Don. Only those absolutely necessary for the artillery regiments, the infantry gun companies and the medical services would remain. All the rest were marched off to the west and stabled in villages in which sufficient supplies of food, stalls and barns were available. This was a risky business, the divisions lost their essential transport. But what else could one do if one was not to leave the animals to starve? That these measures might later contribute to our starving thousands of German soldiers no one considered at the time. In order to save transport space, most of the tanks were also brought to the army's rear area. It had been shown that they were not suitable for the house-to-house -house fighting within the city. The northern and southern fronts were stuck in a battle for positions. Almost all the tanks, those that had not been totally destroyed, needed major repairs. In order to reduce the demands on fuel, spare parts and equipment, the army headquarters had ordered that the tanks be pulled out of the front and moved back to the area west of the Don for restoration. The workshop companies had already taken up their assigned winter quarters. In view of the bad omens on the northern and southern fronts there were no more transfers of the panzer regiments. This was only a small part of Arno von Lenski's memories. I am waiting for your discussions in the comments, also do not forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel see you all soon for now.